Hello, sci-fi and fantasy fans, and welcome to Brandon Yinkit Bowie's Karma of the Sun. I'm Jess, and this is Cam Cat Unwrapped. If you find yourself loving this book as much as we do, CamCat Unwrapped is hosting a giveaway this week where one lucky winner will receive the full audiobook of Karma of the Sun for free. All you have to do to enter is subscribe to our podcast, YouTube channel, or newsletter and answer a quick survey, all of which are linked in our bio. Each new subscription is one entry. So make sure you enter for your chance to win this book to live in. Enjoy. I'll be introducing you to each of our episodes of Brandon Yinkit Bowie's Karma of the Sun, a post-apocalyptic fantasy set in near-future Tibet. It's the eve of the apocalypse. The world as we know it is gone. The only civilization left is in Tibet, shielded from the surrounding doom by the imposing Himalayan range. Until now. The mountains have crumbled. The earth is reeling with its last breaths. The seventh and final apocalyptic sun is coming. Against this backdrop, we meet Karma, a young Sherpa who sets out to find his father who vanished ten years ago in search of a mountain sanctuary. But time is running out. The end is near and Karma knows it. This unputdownable book transports you to a world where adventure is all that remains and summons you to embark on a journey of your own. It's a book to live in. Gird up your yak skin robes. Watch your back against the growing darkness. Look to the mountain, look to the stone, as we venture through the wilds of the Himalayan highlands and journey along with Karma of the Sun. CamCat Publishing presents Karma of the Sun by Brandon Yinkit Bowie, narrated by Kong Sim. For Christina After a last great interval, a seventh sun will appear, and the earth will blaze with fire until it becomes one mass of flame. The mountains will be consumed, a spark will be carried on the wind and go as far as the worlds of God. Therefore, monks, even the monarch of mountains will be burnt and perish and exist no more, excepting those who have seen the path. Paley Canon, 29 BCE Part 1 There were also monks residing in the midst of forests, exerting themselves and keeping the pure precepts as though they were guarding a bright jewel. The Lotus Sutra, 1st century CE. 1. The Yak Karma knows it is a bad omen. He feels it in his body, a sudden chill in the summer air, a passing shadow in the white Tibetan sky, a hush in the rustle of the yellow grasses. One moment the yak calf was with the herd. Now it is gone. The gift for the shaman on his visit, the benefaction their offering, missing. Karma hastens frantically up the rise, climbing hill and dune as he searches, the little boy beside him scampering to keep up, three little steps for every one of his. Bad omen, bad luck, this day of all days. The shaman is to arrive at the village tonight. Soon, the fathers of the valley will bring their sons and the mothers their daughters to have their fortunes told, the spirits consulted. It is karma's turn to graze the herd, his lot, his fate, his fault. Karma's heart pounds as he scales the last hill. The tattered prayer flags of the village outskirts come into view, trembling slightly in the uneven wind. 
They have been placed here purposely, auspiciously, adorning the rusted ruins of the iron wreckage said to have once been able to fly, a stupa to a miracle of the time before the destruction, known only by the name of the Six Suns. Six fires said to have consumed all the earth, leaving only the barons of this remote hinterland. Now the cloth images of the four dignities float like ghosts against the sinking of the western sun, the snow lion, the tiger, the phoenix, and the dragon, chained to the east, south, west, and north. An incongruous form catches the corner of Karma's eye, only paces away from the wreckage like some offering delivered before the stupa. White fur. No movement, except for the fluttering of a few woolen strands. His heart plummets. Before he can even fully comprehend what he is seeing, he already knows it is something terrible. The calfling. It lies on its side. Coming down the dune, karma flinches at the sight of the animal's belly. A large hole gapes from sternum to flank. A jumble of intestines bulges out like a heap of spilled rope from a sack. The ground is a patch of blood so dark it looks black. Karma is paralyzed at the sight, as if it were his own lifeblood drained to the earth. No, it can't be. Not the shaman's offering. Only hours ago, it was alive and with the herd. Now, it is a bloody carcass, viscera baking in the sun. What happened? A boy's voice gasps behind him. Karma startles. It is his little cousin, Lapsung. Karma moves to shield the boy from the sight, but the child is too far out of reach, or perhaps it is only that Karma's legs are too numb. It... it was probably wolves, Karma mumbles. Maybe a pack of them or something. His voice trails. True, there have been more sightings of wild animals, but his instinct tells him this... Is something else. None of the meat has been touched. The yak is a calf, but by no means small. Looking at the sheer size of the wound, nothing on four legs could do damage that looks like this. A swarm of horseflies buzzes fiercely, as if to defend their quarry. A feeling comes over him, even more fearful than before. He has been afraid for the yak, but now that he's found it, he's afraid for the village. If not animals, then bandits? Karma's gaze flickers to the distance, to the flat horizon, the mountains long gone, where the border bandits are known to dwell. Lobsang mirrors his gaze. The vista is empty, but he knows the bandits prefer the night anyway, the better to avoid being shot by the villagers' matchlock rifles. Still, if it was them, wouldn't they steal the calf, not waste it? As depraved as they are, they are more deprived of food, no different from the rest of the four rivers and six ranges. But if neither animals nor bandits... Little Lobsong seems to read his thoughts. Could it be Amigoi? He asks in a hushed voice, invoking the name for the supernatural creature that, thus far, to Karma was nothing but a child's figment. My father says that in the end... The curse becomes even more savage because they know that their doom is near. It's like the ghosts who mourn at night because they will never be reborn. That's quite enough, Lobsang. We shouldn't speak of such things. Karma cannot help a shudder. First the missing yak, then the mutilation. Now talk of Migoy, ghosts, and the coming of the seventh sun. The day is going from inauspicious to downright ominous. The wind stirs and the stink of slowly fouling meat hits them. Karma's little cousin buries his nose in his sleeve, tangling his arm in the necklace of amber and coral that the boy's father gave him that day. We should ask my father what to do, Lobsong says, his voice muffled by his sleeve. It is a perfectly reasonable course of action. Karma has the same urge to leave the scene and go back to the village, but he feels as if he cannot. He is seventeen, not a child. This has happened on his watch. He cannot go back empty-handed. The bones and the hide, the hooves, the fat, and the tendons. He cannot lose the rest to wild animals overnight. 
as the son of the scoundrel, it would be unforgivable. Karma makes up his mind. There isn't enough time. The shaman ceremony will be starting soon. We'll have to drag it back with us, salvage what we can there. He could ask his mother to help him. He meets his cousin's skeptical gaze. The meat's already turned, he explains. If I lose the awful, your father will lash me for sure, is what he wants to say, but doesn't need to. Lapsang seems to understand the logic. A look of sympathy crosses the boy's face, and Karma wonders if his cousin, young as he is, actually understands a lot more. If so, he has never shown it. To Lobsung, Karma is not the cursed Sherpa's boy, not the son of the scoundrel. He is just Karma, and for that, Karma has always loved him. As they begin dragging the carcass away, Karma glances back over his shoulder. The sun is already beginning its descent behind the dusty horizon. Something about the light, the angle of his gaze, a memory floods him, searing in its suddenness, an image of his father in this exact place ten years ago. The entire village is there too. His mother, his aunt, his uncle, the headman. And a caravan, waiting. But not karma. He was only seven years old then, but the memory is clear. He turns his face away. Father's farewell. Are you all right, karma? Karma blinks and the memory vanishes, leaving in its place the empty western landscape, the fluttering prayer flags the only thing stirring. A strand of the penance has come untethered and is snaking now in the air like a loose kite string, whistling as it whips back and forth, back and forth. His little cousin's head is cocked, watching him. What is it? It's nothing, Karma says. Nothing at all. He nods to resume their movement, but though they continue on to the village, something lingers in the air, sticks to them like the scent of the fouling meat they carry, certain only to ripen even more. A feeling of some ill-fated consequence of the past now finding its way back home. 2. The Gathering If the death of the yak signals bad luck, Bringing home its carcass augurs an even worse fate. In hindsight, Karma should have expected the reaction. Fear, anger, blame. He only wanted to do right by the village, thinking of their practical needs. He wanted not to let the people down, not to anger them or remind them of... a father. Wasn't that the truth? That is why he brought the calfling back, after all. When he should have known better when he should have seen it for what it was, a sign of the end, a reminder of the seventh sun, of the curse that hangs over them, and of the powerlessness of herd or village to afford any refuge. But like a fool, he brought it back, and along with it, the ill fate it portends. Now his face stings with shame as he tends the fire in the lodge room alone, stoking the coals, waiting for the villagers to gather. The door opens, bringing in a draft of cold night air accompanied by the low and wind-like moan. Of course, it's not the wind, but the ghosts, who only come in the night, and tonight they are especially restless. The elders enter first. In the shadows, in the flickering firelight, the sunken stares of their eyes are severe. At the front is Ugin, Karma's uncle and Lobsang's father, who, as the village headman, is the one to escort the shaman into the room. The shaman is a grisly sight in his ceremonial garb, a crow's nest weave of finger bones and mirror fragments, a rosary necklace of skull beads, and a belt holding a flute fashioned out of what looks like a femur. Rattling and tinkling, the reflection of the shaman's mirrors casts slivers of light. He is a burning skeleton on the move. Next come the visitors from around the valley of Cam, young men traveling with their fathers to hear the shaman's divinations, young women pushed forward by their mothers hoping for blessings for their future and in them answers about the fate of the world at large. Last come the rest of the villagers, shuffling in order, his mother at the very end of the line, 
Their eyes are on him. All look except his mother, who seems to linger, as if holding open the door to an escape into the ghostly land and fractured stars beyond. But then the door is drawn shut and the crowd closes in. Only enough room to stand. One of the fathers speaks. Is it wise to continue with the ceremonies tonight, Ugin? With a yak offering the Sherpa boy lost, would it not be more auspicious to wait for another date? The Sherpa boy. The scoundrel's son. Me. The shaman is the one to reply with a snort. Six suns, six blasts in the sky, he recites. A seventh one and the earth will die. Can there ever be an auspicious date? The mirrored crown shimmers as he jerks his chin to the assemblage. The infant doesn't choose the day he is born, nor the old man the day he departs. What makes you think you can choose when your boys shall become men or your young girls women? The shaman casts a jaundiced look at the father who has spoken. When our days are numbered, how much time do you think your children have? The man shrinks back to the crowd. Uncle Ugin regards the room impassively. They all know the prophecy. They have heard the recounting of the story that had been told to their grandfathers about the six distant blasts that were so bright they appeared like suns in the sky, and about what they did to the rest of the world. An earth if not scorched, then frozen, dried lakes and drowned deserts, Mountains sunken, valleys leveled. Cities transformed overnight, once towering structures expended like incense to ash by morning. The destructive force of the blasts would have reached Tibet, would have burned them all were it not for the tall range of the Himalayas, which have been their only bulwark, their rock and their defense from the winds and the poisons. But they also know about the telling of one seventh final sun, a last and complete destruction, and there's nothing they can do to stop it. The end, they know, will arrive for them too. Ugin gives the nod. The fire, he commands. Karma immediately pokes the coals, knowing his uncle is talking to him. It is a cold summer night, and the flames have gone down. Karma places more dung chips than a few precious sticks of juniper brush. The belly of the room fills with smoke, the fire begrudgingly offering more of its heat. Move the kettle or you'll spill the chung, chides one of the men. Karma obliges without emoting so much as a sigh of complaint. The brass kettle burns even through the potholder. He pours the steaming liquid into two bowls and carries them to his uncle. Ugin takes one to the altar to make a set of seven bowls filled with water, grain, butter, and now fermented barley. He hands the other to the shaman. Despite the steaming heat, the old man tilts the cup to his mouth, slurping the hot brew down his throat. Uncle Ugin waves to Karma for more. Pour it all. Tonight when the spirits speak, they speak for us all. 3. The Fortune the drums crack and the bells ring, the brass trumpets pulse and the men sway. The shaman hops and dances to the wailing dirge, the mirrored hat and tinseled robes throwing reflections like shattered stars into the crowded room. The old man shows no signs of wearing out for how long he has been dancing, how much he has been drinking. Somewhere between the music and the chanting, he stops to take more swigs of barley brew before resuming his trance. The first boy they take is Lobsang. Ugin brings him forward, father and son going to the altar. Uncle Ugin and Auntie Pema have dressed Karma's cousin in a clean coat tonight, his new amber and coral necklace hanging below the paunch of his robe. Karma watches as the shaman shakes and shudders, spitting a mist of alcohol into the fire. The flames hiss as if responding, smoke rising like a spirit winking coal-red eyes. The diviner comes with barley on his lips, trembling hands outstretched to press the head of the wide-eyed boy. 
Then with a shout that smarts their ears and a strike of Lobsong's crown, the shaman cries through the vortex of horns and cymbals to summon the spirits. Thus possessed, the shaman's tongue loosens. Now comes a strain of pronouncements about a future of crops and money, herds and horses, and a hopeful reincarnation to another world when this one is gone, before he sends the boy into the world with the protection of dead llamas and enslaved but benevolent spirits. Next is a girl. The shaman does the same, twisting and gyrating so that the ribbons on his cloak lift like prayer flags on a cairn, and he seems almost to float off the ground, sending a churn of incantations along with the smoke from the den to the blistered stars beyond the windows. He swoons when he stops, straining like a nomad's tent in the wind. He strikes her head so hard the girl's eyes water. Her mother holding her begins to cry also, jerking to the rhythm of the skeleton drums. And then the utterances pour, fortunes of a fruitful womb and progeny one day like wild foals roaming valleys and hills, while the girl's mother sobs with gratitude, or more likely the grief for what she knows will never be in this life. Last of all is Karma, who comes alone, without a father to bear him forward. He glances across the room to look for his mother in the shadows, but is met only with the glare of the crowd. The Sherpa's son, the shaman says. Karma's face flushes with shame, though the appellation is merely a fact. He is the son of an outsider, the man from away who came to them with promises of deliverance and sanctuary, only to desert them to their doom. Together now, the shaman and karma begin to spin. Around they go, faster and faster. The room is a blur, whistling of flute and jangling of bells, stench of butter lamp oil and yak dung smoke, brew on the shaman's breath and wail of ghosts outside. Karma grows dizzy, his feet stumbling. Just as he thinks he can take no more, the shaman stops. They swoon the room still whirling. The shaman opens his mouth to speak, the pink of his gums showing. But then a sudden change comes over his expression. His face sags, his eyes roll. The mirrored crown atop his head begins to tip. The shaman collapses, sprawling on the floor in a burst of convulsions. Shouts of alarm, flurrying of panic, the elders rush forward. Karma stumbles aside, flustered, head still spinning, heart beating where the drums have stopped. Bad omen. Bad luck. This day of all days. Eventually, the shaman's seizures cease, but his eyes remain closed. The men jostle around him, Uncle Ugin barking orders. A space clears as someone brings more chong and food from the offering table, tipping the cup, chewing the meat, and pushing the food into the shaman's mouth like they are feeding a baby. A trickle of pale beer spills down his beard like milk drool. Slowly, the old man's eyelids crack open. Two inscrutable pupils glint in the firelight, flickering over the circle of faces. Seeking, but not finding, his gaze roves beyond the huddle. A voice with a strange intonation emanates from the shaman's mouth. Within the walls of the lodge room, it sounds strangely to karma like the ghost winds outside. He's not the only one to think so, as the elders begin to draw back cautiously. The ghosts are suffering, the elders whisper to one another. It is because they are trapped. No way to be reborn when the earth is destroyed by the seventh sun. The son of the Sherpa. The elders startle. The words are coming from the shaman, but they are not his. Not a single voice, but multiple voices at once. Karma's skin prickles as a shaman's gaze falls upon him. They know the boy, the elders hiss, because of the father. Bad luck. The familiar guilt floods Karma. The shaman continues to speak, his mouth as detached from the words themselves as a trumpet from the breath that blows it, incriminating. He will follow his father. He will go to him. A shocked murmur sweeps the room. Did he say my father? No one has dared speak of Patrol Sherpa, not for ten years, not with anything but a curse. His name 
has been all but blotted out in the village. Go to my father. No one moves or speaks. Karma's uncle pushes forward through the crowd. Demons. Ugin curses. Deceitful ghosts. He snatches the bowl of Chang and makes a motion as if to toss the contents into the fire. Wait! Karma reaches to stay Ugin's hand, shocked by his own temerity but unable to help himself. It has been years since anyone has openly spoken about his father. He wants to know more. Ugin returns a withering look and Karma's hand falls away. With a jerk of his arm, Ugin tosses the drink. The fire hisses and crackles over the spilled chong, ejecting a puff of smoke. The ghost winds shriek outside, trilling in a crescendo. The shaman's eyelids droop. He twitches before going limp on the ground. Still, Karma leans forward, straining for more, for any other revelation about his father, about himself, anything. Please, if only I could just speak to him. But it is all over. The voices are gone. The shaman's body is inanimate. There is only an old man in a stupor, dribble seeping from his mouth. In the silence of the room, the mysterious pronouncements merely linger in the air like the vapors of a doused fire. Nothing more. Ugin now turns to Karma, his eyes still hard. You should know better. Karma flinches at the words, but of course his uncle is right. After all, his father is a fraud, a thief, the curse of Cam, a scoundrel. Your father cursed this people once before with his lies, Ugin says. Any fortune about him is no fortune at all. Someone is weeping. It takes a moment for Karma to realize that it is his mother. I... I know, Karma stammers, at a loss for what else to say. I'm sorry. But surrounded by the elders of the valley, before the unconscious figure of the shaman on the floor, the words of the ghostly prediction hang in the air. Four, the dark. The harshness of the cold is a welcome relief to the reeking warmth as Karma bursts out of the lodge into the night. His breath streams in clouded puffs. He has the urge to run, to get as far away from the lodge as possible, from the village, from the whole valley even. He will follow his father, the spirit said. He will go to him. The villagers' voices spill outdoors. A drunken song warbles through the air, along with the sound of low, mingling conversation. But Karma does not tarry. He does not join in any of the exchange. He quickens his pace, almost reckless in the dark, anxious to avoid another person. Clouds have moved in, lumbering cold and still hiding stars behind their cumulus rises. Below, the earth is a different story. The land at night always sways in slow tremors, like the motion of a giant sieve, growing, then fading, growing, then fading, shifting, sorting, unstable. The residual warmth dissipates, and Karma begins to feel the cold. He slips the dangling half of his robe over himself, the yak hair wool too warm for the stuffiness of the lodge, pushing his arms through the baggy sleeves and tightening the jute sash. The voices behind him drop away, and finally he is alone with the wailing of the ghosts in the blackness of night. Gravel crunches. Something stirs in the dark behind him. Karma spins to face the sound, his mind conjuring up the lurking of ghosts. Or is it a Migoy, after all? He was foolish to go off alone, too hasty in his desire to get away. But when a shape emerges from the shadows, it is only his uncle. He slowly stalks toward Karma, drinking bowl in his hand, stopping to take a swig when he sees him. Risky to be wandering off by yourself after dark, Uncle Ugin chides. Especially with how you found the calfling today, wouldn't you say? Karma says nothing in reply, taking the remark as the rebuke that it is meant to be. Even in the dark, he can feel his uncle's gaze, probing, judging. What do you think you heard tonight? His uncle continues. 
The problem is that you can't really tell how much it is the spirits talking, or if it's just the spirits. Ugin downs the rest of the drink, shaking out the emptied bowl with an air of irony. Is this his uncle's version of conciliation? Karma knows what he heard. The words spoken by the shaman were as clear as they were unexpected. Ugin goes on. The truth is, the future holds the same fate for all of us. The seventh sun is coming. No fortune telling can change that. Karma remains quiet, hesitant to say what he is thinking. The first six of the seven suns had destroyed the earth, so that all that remains is the land of the four rivers and six ranges, shielded at first by the protective wall of the Himalayas from the blasts. Until now, earthquakes have come and toppled those mountains, leaving the land just as vulnerable. All except for one mountain, his father said. It was this proclamation of his father's that began it all, gave the people hope until he left with supplies and people and money never to be seen again. But now, Karma is beginning to wonder, what if his father was right after all? In the cover of night, under strange stars so cold and dispassionate, the utterance from the shaman runs through his mind again. He will follow his father. He will go to him. Karma will take the leap. The shaman spoke of looking for my father. Despite the darkness, the stiffening of his uncle's posture is perceptible. Karma is on dangerous ground, bringing up his father again. He knows this, but he has also sensed an opening. Perhaps it is some guilt on his uncle's part, however small, for cutting him off over the shaman's message earlier. But it is enough. Uncle, Karma plows ahead, what if I tried to find him now? The outline of his uncle's shoulders rises. What if you tried to find him now? Ugin repeats Karma's words like someone rolling a bitter taste around in his mouth. Karma tries to explain. We say that everything has changed because of the quakes. The land, even the stars are out of place. It's become impossible to orient ourselves with accuracy anymore. What if the reason he never returned is not that he abandoned us, but just that he's lost? Lost? Ugin exhales the air through his teeth, making a cutting sound. Let me remind you, in case for some reason you have forgotten, your father was a liar and a thief, a Sherpa trader who came to our village seducing the people with stories of a sanctuary in the mountains. He asked for men and provisions for an expedition, for horses and yaks. He duped my own brother Tenzing into going with him, leaving the village, and for what? If your father is speaking to ghosts, then maybe he is dead. Good riddance. But my brother was innocent. The words singe karma and remind him why he never speaks about his father. So much blame, so much disappointment. But also this conclusion. Even if his father was a charlatan, by now, no one knows what has become of him anyway. How he could have been so stupid as to believe it, I will never know. Ugin continues. And how could your mother fall for such a scheme and for such a man, looking to some stranger with a faraway promise instead of seeing what was right in front of her? His uncle spits in the dark, eyes boring hard and black into karma. But the bird always shows its feathers. Not content with what he had already taken, he had to steal from us too. It wasn't until he was gone, and it was too late to stop him, but we discovered it in the end. I discovered it. The money gone, just as he was gone. Ugin shakes his head. Lost? He repeats with a spiteful snort. No. The reason he never came back is because he never meant to come back. Not for us, not for your mother, and not for you. He betrayed us all. Karma flinches. If his uncle's words in the lodge room had been a slap in the face, these were a kick to his gut. Your mother has kept a lot of the truth from you, Ugin goes on. Not that she made it any easier on either of you. I would have taken you both in. I would have cared for her as if she was my own wife. 
but her mind was already clouded by her father's lies. Even now, ten years after the scoundrel abandoned her, she will not accept the fact that she will never see him again. What she even saw in him in the first place, I will never fathom. A Sherpa without a mountain, as useless as a shepherd without a flock. He pauses. Or a boy without a future. Karma feels his face warming, an impotent, meaningless reaction, not even bold enough to be visible in the shroud of night. These are all things Karma has heard before, things he knows people say. He has become used to it, but tonight, he feels them like a fresh wound. I did you a favor back there, nephew, Ugin says. Anything to do with your father is karma you don't want. The ghostly keening in the night rises in pitch, discordant and bone-chilling, whistling through crevices of stone and earth. Overhead, the clouds have drifted from one end of the sky to another, revealing unrecognizable stars. The heaven's skies turn sullen, the night's subtlety gone. Could you really do it anyway? Uncle Ugin asks. And I'm not just talking about the improbability of surviving the borderlands alone. Or what the minister's patrollers would do to you, not to mention the entire village, in retribution if they catch you leaving the territories. But could you leave your mother? Could you leave Labsung, who looks to you like an older brother? Would you abandon them when you know your father abandoned you? The silence between Karma and his uncle is heavy, the answer palpable. <laughs> I didn't think so, Ugin says, because deep down, you know. You will never see him again, not in this life, and if you're lucky, not in the life to come. There is no time for looking back, nor any reason to look ahead. You are needed right here, right now, to prepare for the end. It is coming. Even the ghosts know it. That's why they mourn. He stops talking then, distracted suddenly by a sound over the wind, barely noticeable, yet conspicuous in its contrast from the keening of the night. But it is not the ghost winds this time. Listen, Ugin hisses. Do you hear that? A galloping noise, coming from downwind, fleeting and hard to make out. What is that? Growing louder and then unmistakable, the muffled hoofbeats of horses approaching. Their understanding is immediate, their conclusion simultaneous. Bandits. Curses bound from Ugin's mouth. Of all the damn things! He whirls back toward the lodge. Riders! He shouts, raising the alarm. Bandits in the night! Get the rifles! Defend the village! The sense of foreboding returns to karma. Bad omen, bad luck. Karma tries to follow his uncle, but in the chaos of the night, he becomes disoriented, for a moment unable to tell which direction he is heading. The crack of a rifle's retort, followed by the base of its echo from the direction of the lodge, pulls him back in. The sounds of whooping and jeering pierce the night. Hooves clatter around the village. Karma wheels about in rising panic. Mother, Lobsung. More shots. Fire stabbing in the dark. The villagers are firing haphazardly, but at least they're shooting. The char of gun smoke drifts through the air. But then, as suddenly as they began, the sounds recede. The hoofbeats fade, drifting farther, the whoops of the bandits dimming. Were they abandoning the raid already? Could the rifles, as old and inaccurate as they are, have repelled them so easily? Karma! Thankfully, he sees his mother stumbling toward him his aunt in tow behind her. Relief floods him. Mother, Auntie Pema, over here. But something is wrong. It is his aunt. She is sobbing, staggering, barely able to stand. Uncle Ugin appears, an armed group of the village men with him, rifles and torches in hand. He sees his wife too. What is it? Ugin barks. Are you hurt? Where is Lobsang? He clutches his rifle at the ready, a long, wooden matchlock mounted by a pair of antelope horns like the prongs of a pitchfork. The groan that comes from Auntie Pema turns Karma cold. For once, 
The moaning of the ghost winds does not sound so loud or so terrible compared to the wail of Auntie Pema's voice. She crumples like an ash heap. Beside her, Karma's mother sinks to the ground as well, clutching her sister as if afraid she will disintegrate completely. The men's faces are stunned in the firelight. Auntie Pema's next words confirm what they somehow already know. The bandits, Pema cries. They took him. They took our son. Five, the minister. Daylight brings no trace of Lapsang. Search parties separate through the valley to the wreckage of iron and prayer flags to the west, the plains in the north, the stone tower to the south. They bring their matchlock rifles, though what they will do if they encounter the bandits, Karma does not know. They do not venture too far, do not dare to plan a search past the valley. The minister or his patrollers have forbidden it. As the day wanes, they prepare to check the eastern dunes. Uncle Ugen whips his horse onward. The men follow, but their grim faces speak what they are afraid to say, that Lobsang is long gone. Riding toward a rising dune, the sound of hoofbeats echoes ahead. At first, Karma thinks it's their own noise, but then a flurry of movement and a tide of bright crimson rises suddenly over the crest. Banners, streaming down the slopes. In an instant, the hills are awash in red. The color, Karma thinks, of the minister's army. The men startle. It's a patrol, Ugin. They'll see our weapons. But it is too late to hide them, too late to stop. They have already been seen. To try to run would be futile. To resist would be suicide. Ranks of cavalry stream down, coming now directly toward them, and following the cavalry is a formation of foot soldiers. On their shoulders rides the boxy carriage of a wooden palanquin, carved in gold-accented, caparisoned in crimson silk. This is no patrol. The faces of the men quail at the realization. This is a whole troop of the Eastern Army. Their voices become panicked. Ugen, the carriage! It's the Lord Minister! Karma feels a shudder of dread. Why are they here? It is not the time for collecting the tributes. The four times yearly when the patrollers would come to take their due, yak, wool, ore, and conscripts for the army. Nor would the minister come himself for that reason. Karma has never seen him before, of course. But he knows the descriptions of the Lord of the Four Rivers and Six Ranges, who rides on a chariot carried not by horses, but on the backs of men. Like a pincer, the cavalry separates, flanking them on both sides to surround the band of villagers. Ugen's horse rears. The other villagers wrangle at the reins of their jittery horses. From the head of the formation of soldiers, a single rider canters to the fore, his chainmail tunic making chinking sounds with each step like the counting of coins. The voice that hails them through a red turban-faced scarf is loud and authoritative, the voice of a patroller captain. Relinquish your weapons! Ugen drops his rifle to the ground. It tumbles, hitting the dirt with a clunk of surrender. The others follow, throwing their motley arsenal without challenge. On your knees, the captain orders. The village men cast themselves from their horses. Karma likewise dismounts, prostrating himself on the hot, dry grass. Foot soldiers stomp forward, snatching away their rifles. Then all seems to go still. From the ground, Karma's uncle stammers. We, we, we beg your pardon, sir. We did not know the Lord Minister was here. Who are you to question the Lord Minister's business, bandit? Sir, we are no bandits. Rebels, then. You have been caught with arms. Ugen flusters. Please, sir. Our village was attacked by bandits. They took my son. These weapons are for our protection. The Lord Minister is your protector. Captain. Another voice, much different, softer, speaks. The captain bows, ceasing his questioning instantly. My lord. Karma risks a furtive glance toward the sound of the other voice. Past the patrollers, past the retinue of banners and spears, a hand parts the curtains of the palanquin window, 
its arm wreathed in red brocade and golden bangles. From the lofty perch, a round face emerges, moon-like in its paleness as if untouched by the wind or sun, an arrangement of peacock feathers adorning its crown like the unblinking eyes of some all-seeing deity, and Karma knows for certain now. It is Hanumantha, lord of the eastern army, minister of the four rivers and six ranges. His eyes survey the group of villagers before him, crossing Karma's gaze. Karma lowers his head quickly, fearing reprisal for his impertinence. To his amazement, the voice that comes is quiet, almost kind. These men are not the enemy. Yes, my lord, the captain demurs. The door of the palanquin creaks open, and now the lord minister is stepping out. He approaches the men, the sound of his retinue rustling to follow him. He directs his voice to Ugen. You say that your son was taken? My lord, yes, Ugen stammers in reply. They came into our village and took him. Bring the litter, the Lord Minister orders. Karma risks another glance from the ground. The retinue parts as two men trot forward, carrying a gurney between them. Karma immediately recognizes the small figure. His uncle is already on his feet. Lobsang, my son! Karma's heart leaps, but just as quickly it plummets. His cousin is not moving. The boy's eyes are closed, his face still and passive. Oh no, oh, Lapsang. The minister waves the guards aside as Ugen dashes to him, dropping to his knees beside the boy. How did this happen? Your gang of bandits had the misfortune of crossing paths with the Eastern Army last night, Hanumantha says. In their attempt to evade our troops, there was an accident, but I would not fret. According to my physician, he will wake eventually. I assure you, the bandits were far less fortunate. Ugen clutches Lapsang to his body, and Karma can see the color draining from his uncle's face. Thank you, his uncle swallows. How fortuitous that your lordship was there. Yes, the minister replies, though not strictly serendipitous. His gaze suddenly flicks back to Karma, catching him by surprise, this time fixing him with his eyes. You see, the minister continues, we have come searching for someone too. Karma's uncle blinks. Glancing down at Lapsang's unconscious face, he collects himself, wiping at the corners of his eyes. Someone, my lord? In these parts of the valley? If there is any assistance we can impart. The lord minister Hanumantha smiles in return, and for some reason the expression fills Karma with a sense of dread even deeper than before. There was a man, the minister says, who came from the mountains, a Sherpa. Dread now turns to shock. The ill-fated feeling of yesterday's discovery rushes back to Karma, and then the feeling of guilt, of destiny, coming home to roost, of a curse inescapable. As the minister says his next words, I I'm looking for his son. Six, the Tabernacle. The tent of the great tabernacle of Lord Minister Hanumantha shudders from the winds. Karma and his mother sit within the cocoon of crimson cloth alone, save for the shadows of servants blinking in and out from behind the curtains. Karma wondered at first if the structure would hold against the valley's punishing winds. The homes in the valley are built squat and heavy, stacks of rock bracing against the worst of the southwest gales. In contrast, this tent is tall, a miracle of engineering that the villagers gawked at as the soldiers erected it to its full height. Even with the hurling of the wind's broadside, the massive spectacle stands. Now the curtains shuffle, the great drapes part, from the bowels of the tabernacle, Lord Minister Hanumantha strides into the sanctum and ascends a raised dais. Through the dim lamplight and the smoke of the incense censers swinging from the rafters, he studies them. After a long moment, he speaks, his first words directed at Karma. 
I see Sherpa Patrol's resemblance in you. Karma blinks. Did the minister just say that he knows my father? He glances at his mother. My lord, she says, her expression equal parts bewildered and afraid. You have seen my husband? My patrollers arrested him and his companions many years ago, Hanumantha answers, trying to cross into the borderlands. His mother's face pales even more. My lord, I did not know. The minister holds up a hand. His clothing tinkles with the movement of embroidered stones. Rest assured, I did not come to condemn, but on the contrary, to pay honor and respect. Honor, respect. These are not words ever associated with his father. Is this some test, some form of interrogation? The ministers said they had arrested him. Leaving the territories was forbidden. Those who did so were assumed to be deserters, rebels, or generally traitorous to the Lord Minister. Have the patrollers now come because they suspect Paltrow's own family of being the same? The quakes destroyed what was left of the Himalayan range, the Lord Minister goes on. Yet your husband embarked on a search for a refuge in the mountains anyway. Now the worry deepens. Karma remembers what his uncle said to him. The wrongdoing of one could bring punishment on the entire village. Like a curse. My lord, Karma's mother says shakily. My husband was a dreamer. He heard sounds. Sherpa horns blowing from afar. He thought it was his people calling to him from the dead for help. Your headman seems to believe it was a ruse to steal from the village, no different than the deceptions of so many charlatans and false sorcerers who prey on the ignorant these days. Have mercy, my lord, she pleads. He grieved for his people. He was not in his right mind. I thought it was a gift. I could not stop him. Nor should you have, Honumantha says, surprising them with his answer. It's why we sent him on his way, with some of our own men to help with his expedition. Karma's mother looks confused. My lord, you helped him? Six suns, six blasts in the sky. A seventh one and the earth will die, goes the prophecy, he recites. There were many fantastical things made by the people from the time before, things we can barely even imagine. The wreckage of that great iron bird outside your village. Amazing to think that it could once fly, carrying people through the skies. But the most unfathomable creations were their weapons, which unleashed destruction on such a massive scale that they rivaled the sun in fieriness that on command could annihilate a whole civilization in the blink of an eye, even the whole earth. Indeed, that is what has been left of the world now because of the six of those suns waiting until the seventh and final one finishes off the land of the four rivers and six ranges. He pauses, as if to let the words sink in. Yet, despite this doom, we have also been left with one glimmer of hope. Consider the second verse. But gather to the mount and the seeing stone that the Lama may reveal yet a future unknown. Karma suppresses a recoil. He can feel his mother doing the same. That verse, those words, it is not that the words themselves, abstruse auguries he will never understand, hold any meaning for him. But according to his mother, they are the very words his father quoted when he came to the village. Karma knows enough about the myth of the seeing stone to know that it convinced the villagers. Or deceived them. A glimmer of hope? More like a shameful shadow. The Lord Minister leans forward. The monks have records going back to the last Lama, to the time before the suns. They say that the seeing stone is the key, that anyone who can look into it can see what has happened in the past, but only a Lama can also see how to change the future, including how to stop the seventh sun. I believe that this stone was the answer Paltrul was searching for, and found. 
A lull in the wind turns the tabernacle silent. Karma and his mother stare, stunned. Karma's mind does not understand. The words make no sense. For so long, his father has been the scoundrel, the liar, the thief. Now the Lord Minister is telling them that his father was right. The answer Paltrow was searching for and found. Suddenly the walls of the tent feel untethered, the shaking of the canvas as if the wind at any moment would tear it away to reveal an unsheltered sky. My father was right after all, Karma blurts out. The outburst is impudent, he knows it immediately. For someone of his standing to direct a question at the minister without the proper form of address, no less. But the words and thoughts spill out faster than he can contain them. He was telling the truth about the mountain? But instead of censuring him, the Lord Minister replies gently. Your mother said it herself. He could hear the suffering of his people who died in the quakes. In the moans of the ghost winds, the dead were calling to him. Karma's heart rises in elation. He knew it. Always, deep down, he has believed that his father was faithful. Where is it then? Karma says. Where is my father now? Now Hanumantha pauses, his face becoming somber. I'm afraid this is the difficult part. Along the way, your father and his Kumba travel companion went missing from the expedition. My men searched for days, high and low, but never did see them again. They were gone. Maybe fallen into the earth, maybe bandits, maybe wolves or beasts, or worse. Just as quickly as his hopes rose, Karma feels a crushing weight come cascading back onto him. Unless, Hanumantha continues, Karma looks up at the Lord Minister, unless? He is afraid of the words that will follow. To the village, under Uncle Ugen, it has always been as if his father never existed. But somehow, that is not as bad as thinking that his father is dead. To Karma, it has always meant that perhaps someday, somehow, his father would return. He has always harbored this hope in secret. Not even to his mother has he dared to bring it up, lest it give her any hope she could not stand to have. Maybe he is someplace where he cannot reach us, the Lord Minister says, as if he were speaking of another village in the valley. Maybe he has found the spirits, but he just cannot find his way back, not without some help. He fixes his gaze back on Karma, as if waiting for him to say something in return. It is what Karma said to his uncle just the night before, only to be reproved. But now, Karma is too confused to speak. Why? His mother says instead. Why are you telling us this now? What can we do, powerless as we are? It is not so much a voice of protest or even disbelief, but rather heartbreak and helplessness. The Lord Minister replies with the measured cadences of someone counting out tales of silver. Because the end is upon us, he says, and there is no hope of escaping it. Six suns, six blasts in the sky, a seventh one, and the earth will die. The first six suns have already destroyed the world outside the four rivers and six ranges. The seventh sun will come soon. Our shamans have seen the signs, Earthquakes and storms unceasing, more blood than water flowing. Beasts become the hunters and man the prey, stars losing their places and stranding the traveler. This is why the mourning of the ghosts grows louder every night, because they too know that time is running out. He holds up two slender fingers, repeating the second verse like a mantra. But gather to the mount and the seeing stone that the Lama may reveal yet a future unknown. We must find the mountain and the Lama. We must change the future. Now it all makes sense. The reason for karma's unease, for the sense of foreboding. He has felt it since seeing the red over the dunes. Even the day before, at the sight of the blood-soaked yak by the prayer flags, he has felt it all these years, growing, accumulating, as constant as the morning of the ghost winds at night. And now he begins to see that it is fate. Uncle Ugin cannot deny him now.
The monks say the Lama is a reincarnation from the time before the suns. Hanumantha says, Tomorrow I will leave to join my troops gathered at the borderlands to search for this child. What I need now is help finding the mountain where the seeing stone resides. What I need is for you to find your father. Again, Karma is stunned. Again, it is his mother who responds. But my son was born right here in the valley, my lord, she protests. He knows nothing about the mountains. Your husband was led by a gift. My husband had dreams. He heard the sound of a Sherpa's horn when no one else did. Karma has never experienced the same thing. Haven't I? A dream? A shimmer of a glimpse here, an echo of a sound there. He can remember, as a child, being with his father and watching the herd and hearing a sound, a distant burring. What if I have? Karma says, before he can catch himself, before he's even sure if he's right. Despair crushes his mother's face, any semblance of hope seeming to drain from her body. Why did he say it? Perhaps he should have kept his silence. But it is too late now. Be glad, mother, Hanumantha says. Your family is the only hope we have of escaping the seventh son. To save your village and all of the four rivers and six ranges, the same village that cursed your husband's name when he didn't return, but now they will come to know the truth. At those words, a lump forms in Karma's throat. Is it possible? Is there a chance that he will no longer be the scoundrel's son? With a mere flick of his hand, the Lord Minister summons a servant who immediately appears carrying a pillow with an object wrapped in red silk on it. Hanumantha unbundles it, revealing a knife, one unlike any Karma has seen. The scabbard gleams silver, filigreed and inlaid with gemstones. Its handle looks like ice, crystal clear and colorless, some kind of quartz. When he draws the blade, the metal is black in color and mottled in texture. Instead of the typical flat shape, it is a three-sided spike. He comes down from the dais, approaching Karma and his mother with the object displayed in both hands. This was found by my men. It is a ritual knife from a time when there were still llamas. The blade is made of the ore of a meteorite, representing the power of heaven on earth. The handle is crystal, its translucence symbolizing a clear grip on truth. In all of the four rivers and six ranges, I have come across nothing like it. He turns to Karma's mother. And it was your husband's. But I have never seen it before, Karma's mother says. No, Hanumantha affirms. And that is the proof that he found something on that journey. Hanumantha returns the blade to its silver sheath, startling Karma when he then holds the knife out to him. It's yours now, a gift from father to son, just like the other gifts of his that you already possess. Karma stares at the object. The Lord Minister takes Karma's hand and puts it into his palm. The crystal and silver are cool to the touch. Within the facets of the glass, the light of the incense burners bends and multiplies. The monks say that the mountain is a sacred place, a meeting ground between our world and the other world. Find the stone, and not only will you redeem your father's name, but perhaps you shall also see him again. Karma swallows, the lump burning within him now as if it has become a coal. Find the mountain, find the seeing stone. This was his father's task, the duty they said he left unfulfilled. But Karma has always known better, and now there is proof. He holds it in his hands. For the first time, there's a hope he'd never had. A mountain sanctuary in which his father has found a stone that could change the future, perhaps even stop the seventh sun and save the four rivers and six ranges. But most of all, a stone that would let him see his father again. The keening of the wind outside seems to grow into a faraway cry. The Lord Minister is right. 
By no mistake of the imagination, tonight they sound even more tortured than usual, more desperate. The pelting of sand and lashing of wind is like the scratching of nails and gnashing of teeth, raging against time and its incessant advance. But is his father's voice among them, among the spirits of the departed waiting to be freed, calling to his son? Find the stone, and not only will you redeem your father's name, but perhaps you shall also see him again. Karma's fingers tighten around the knife, gripping the handle as if to grasp the opportunity. It's all he's ever wanted, the one thing he has yearned to do. He looks at his mother a final time. This time, he tries to convey resolve, to reassure her that all will be well, all will be right. But in her eyes, he sees only fear. 7. The Dawn Karma knows he is dreaming. First, there is the terrain. Not the dry, valley grassland, but green and forested earth. Not expansive and flat, but high and mountainous. Then, there are the mists, as thick as clouds, rolling downrange, shedding light summer snow. This is not the Valley of Kam. Around him, people are everywhere, walking, wandering, filling the mountain slopes, Karma is walking too, though where he is going, he does not yet know. He has the sense of an endlessness of horizon, of time too, of waiting. He looks at the people as they walk, strange faces, races he has never before seen, with colored eyes and strange clothing. But there is something else, something different about this sea of people that he cannot quite determine. A transparency in their presence, in their movements, a sense of walking in place, without progress, without change, no matter how long they move, as if trapped. Karma looks around, suddenly nervous. He tries to speak to the people to get their attention, ask them what is wrong, but they do not acknowledge him. He cannot talk to them. They do not even seem to see him. Despite being immersed in the stream of people, he is separate from their world. Because this is the other world and they are the dead. It dawns on him suddenly. These are the wandering deceased, the specters of the ghost winds. Then this must be the world between death and rebirth. And now his panic grows. Why is he here? Why can he see them? Up ahead, a white shape darts out from behind a boulder, crouching, an animal, muscled and snowy-haired, feline, watching him, waiting for him, a snow lion. Karma knows the mythical animal instinctively, even though he has never seen it before, even though he knows it is not real, the first of the four dignities from the prayer flags. This is just a dream. When the animal growls, the low, throaty sound rumbles through the range. Follow me, its eyes seem to say, this way. It lets out a roar. This time the resounding echo of its voice reminds Karma of the blare of a horn. It whirs through the mists, echoing off the rock, a deep sound, a swallowing sound. Om. Follow it. The snow line bounds up the slope, away from the multitude of spirits. Karma hesitates, glancing at the stream of spirits, but they do not seem to see the line or hear it, except for one lone person, Karma sees a man split off from the masses, turning to follow the snow line up the steepening terrain. Specks of white begin to drift from the sky, snowflakes that never touch the ground. His back is to him, but Karma knows who it is. Father. The mountain mist moves in, masking Karma's view, the man vanishing into the perimeter of cloud. Father, wait! Karma scampers up the slope, chasing after him. Loose scree crumbles, cascading as his footsteps displace broken rock. Rounding a boulder, he sees his father again, even higher. The snow line by now is nowhere in sight. Only the echo of its roar still beckons to them. More clouds drift in. He must keep up or he will lose him. Om. The fog thins, 
as if he is breaking through the ceiling of the cloud barrier. He sees his father perched on a rock, hands cupped to his ears, listening. The clouds peel back, rolling away to reveal a triangle of white, looming bright and clear in the dim gray sky. Massive in size, dazzling in beauty. Karma stares in awe. The mountain, it is real. He shouts again to his father, joy now suffusing through him. His father hears the shout, begins to turn around. A boom shudders the air, wrenching his father's head back toward the sky before Karma can glimpse his face. The earth trembles. Suddenly, it heaves. For a moment, all is suspended in midair. A flash of light streaks over the peak, so bright it could be the sun, eclipsing his father's silhouette and filling the sky with a blinding whiteness. Karma cries out, shielding his eyes, but his voice is swallowed up. A wind surges, blasting down the mountain. He is thrown back, flattened to the ground. Over the horizon, an inferno mushrooms, a raging tower of flame swelling in force, expanding toward him. Shrieks fill the air, shrieks, Karma realizes, of the dead. The fire thunders down the mountain. It sweeps across the range. In an instant, it engulfs the heavens, the earth, and everything in between, until all that is left is his own voice, screaming. Karma jolts awake in his bed, shaking, chest heaving. His vision is blurred, his face streaming with tears. A dream, just a dream. Gasping, he lies there for a moment, his mind still reeling, the dream world still leaning on his consciousness, like the lingering of a presence once someone is gone. The image of his father permeates his mind, of him turning to look at karma, but at that moment, the flash had burst over his father's shoulder and the flare had swallowed him up in its light. I could not see his face. He was there, but I could not see it. He squeezes his eyes shut, trying to will into existence any other recollection of his father. There's a memory somewhere. He feels it, lingering just beneath the surface. He tries to think back to the things he can remember, grazing the yak herd together in the haze of a dry windstorm, the two of them watching the sunset as the valley turns to pink from gold, silhouettes in the dark when it was over, and of course, the last memory he has of him. The view, as he peered out from the iron wreckage, of his father's back as he called and called to karma before finally giving up, departing to the west, never to be seen again, never to return. And never a clear picture. The face of his father eludes him still. All the memories, all incomplete. The memories of a child. And the understanding of a child, too. How much did he truly know about his father? Could they really share the same gift? Would his father even recognize him? How can I expect to follow in his footsteps? He hears a quiet sound of sniffling coming from the other side of the woolen partition. He wipes his eyes, sitting up. From his mattress, he glances across the darkened room. Night clings to the corners, though dawn begins to punch through the dusk. Karma gathers his robes out of the bedding and slips into them, tightening the sash turning his blanket back into clothing as he slides his feet into the shoes on the dirt floor. Venturing out from the curtain, he finds his mother still in bed, her back toward him, face to the door. Mother, Karma says. Her voice is tearful. I've said goodbye to a husband before. Must I do the same to a son? Uncle Ugen's question tugs now at Karma's chest. Can he do it? Can he leave her? Or Lobsang still unconscious? Karma goes to the edge of her bed, stooping to sit on the mattress corner. Outside, the stars are blinking out. With the onset of dawn, the ghosts are retiring and the darkness is still. The first time it happened, his mother says, your father woke one morning saying he could hear an echo in the sky. The sounding of the Sherpa horns, he said calling to one another in the mountains. I thought he was bewitched. You were talking about horns that are gone, sounding from people who are dead in mountains that have collapsed, I told him. She pauses. But the truth is, there are times, 
I think I can hear things too. I imagine I could hear him among the ghosts. She curls herself into her pillow as if muffling a moan of pain. Like he is watching us. But we can't talk to him. We can't see him. I dream of him, Karma confesses, but I can't see him either, not face to face. I didn't want to admit it, Karma's mother shakes her head, but I've always known, and now I know for sure. He is dead. He is gone. My paltrel is never coming home, and soon my son will leave too. The seventh son has not even come, but already I will have lost everything. When the village discovered the missing money, Uncle Ugen and the people declared him a charlatan and a thief, but deep down, Karma knew his mother never blamed him. Despite the trials that followed, she never regretted her marriage, regardless of what her sister or Uncle Ugen said. She has her son, and to her, that is a blessing far greater than any curse. If Karma is to leave her too, she will have nothing left. I can't do it he realizes. Not this way. I don't have to go, Karma declares. I won't. Maybe if I just stay, he'll come home one day, or maybe he won't, like the minister said, and we should just accept it. Maybe it's like people say, that it was because he cheated death in the mountains that fate caught up to him. His mother turns sharply to face him, her expression suddenly severe. No, her voice rises in vigor. Never say that. You heard the minister. He did nothing wrong. He was your father, still is. Not some condemned Migoy they make him out to be. He was not cursed, at least no more than the rest of them. Do they think their fate is any different? Never believe that. Not about him. Not about yourself. They blame him because he gave them hope, and now they have no one else to believe in. But it was the world's karma that got us here, not his. The anger leaves her face. It was hope. That was why he left Karma. Not to run away, not because he believed he carried a curse, but because he could still feel them. He could see his people in his dreams. They should have been dead beyond all reach, but he could still hear them sounding their horns, just as if they were alive. It was a sign to him that there is something more, something beyond the end. That's why he left us, to find it, so that even if the world ends in the seventh sun, there can still be hope. Karma looks down, dreams. He has those too, dreams like the one he just had, dreams that tell him things, but always terrible dreams, because death is always a part of them. Your father used to say, a Sherpa's destination becomes his destiny. Though he cannot always see the end, he leads so others can follow. Her voice grows soft. And that is why I know you must go. Mother, you must finish what he started, Karma, as much as it breaks my heart. Her voice quivers. Or else the curse will be our fate and the condemnation ours. The low moaning of the ghost winds crescendos suddenly outside, the spirit voices usually gone this close to dawn. His mother hears it too. The ghosts of the dead are just as trapped as we are, she says. When the world is gone, there will be nowhere for them to be reborn. Your father felt that he had to help them, to try to free both the living and the dead from our fate under the seventh sun, and that is why you must go too. Because if, if he is dead, his mother's voice trembles, then he is with them now, and he needs you more than ever. We all need you. Karma swallows, finding the knot that has been in his throat now in his stomach. What if I end up wandering lost in the mountains, Karma says. I heard the horns once, but it's been so long. She straightens her back, nodding like she has never been more certain. Better off wandering lost in the mountains than languishing to die in the valley. If there is a future, it's not here. Karma presses his lips together. He says nothing, 
knowing the choice is clear. He clears his throat. The minister's guards will keep watch over all of you, he says at last, fighting hard not to let his voice waver. I will see to it. To protect the village, to be sure that what happened to Lobsang will never happen to you or anyone else, that alone is worth the sacrifice. It is you they must watch over, his mother replies. Life in the territories may be harsh under the minister's law, but the lawlessness of the borderlands is worse. I will be all right, Karma says. Nothing is safer than traveling with a patroller escort. Out there, it's the warlords, not the Lord Hunamantha who rule, his mother warns. And if you do go beyond the borderlands to the wasteland, you will have yourselves to contend against because... There is only barrenness beyond devastation. I will return, mother. Karma's mother gazes at him, trying to put on a strong smile. Yes, she says finally, voice thickening with what must be the courage she is mustering to say the words. You will, with your head held high. In the dark of their home, in the chill air, Karma makes an oath before the rising sun. I promise. A warbler buzzes outside. They hear the yap of the terriers. On the eastern horizon, the first ray of sunlight shoots out through the valley, reaching the threshold's open door. It seems like fates have aligned with the minister's visit. He dangles the hope that in Karma's father's disappearance lies an answer, not just to what happened in the past, but what might happen in the future. Now begins the race against the apocalypse. What waits for Karma outside the valley? What secrets and what dangers? Stay tuned to find out in our next episode. So don't forget to subscribe to CamCat Unwrapped. Tune in to hear all our audiobooks as we release them right here on CamCat Unwrapped as serialized podcasts. The first two episodes of every book can always be found here, but subsequent episodes will be available for free listening only for a short time after their release. After that, they'll be gone. But don't worry. The audiobooks are available for purchase on Audible and other major retailers. If you don't want to miss a beat, listen now on the audiobook platform of your choice. All our books are also available in print and ebook formats on camcatbooks.com or wherever books are sold. Before you go, please take a moment to leave us a review on your preferred podcast platform. Thank you. CamCat Unwrapped also offers other CamCat books as podcasts. Also, check out our interviews with authors, editors, and other bookworms in our background episodes, where we unwrap exclusive content relating to our books. Tune in again to CamCat Unwrapped, because CamCat Unwrapped is where book lovers meet.